In this video, we're going to check if the one liter EcoBoost engine is all in time, and if all that checks out, then we can finally put everything back together and get it fitted back in the car for the final time. last video we fitted a new head gasket, reinstalled the cylinder head, fitted all the cams, we installed a new timing belt, fitted the cam cover, and then installed the crank pulley and the infamous crank pulley bolt. And if I ever hear the words crank pulley bolt again, it'll be too soon. A lot of people were wondering how I was actually going to tighten this up and what I did is actually fitted the engine back in the car so I had all the engine mounts in to hold the engine steady while well, I tightened this up to 300 newton meters plus an extra 90 degrees. If you haven't seen that video already then it's in the top corner go check it out. So that is all tightened up now but I pulled the engine back out of the car last night just so I had a lot more space to work around it. I mean it was literally three engine mounts to get this done you know just whipping it back out with a crane so I got it back out so that I could do the final assembly. But before I can do that, I need to take all the locking tools off of here. So there's these two on the camshafts. There's also the VVT locking tools that we've got in here. There's the setting pin here, which just sets the crankshaft in place. And then we did have the uh, flywheel locking tool on here, but that had to come off so that I could get the engine back up on the engine stand. So that's already been removed. We won't need to refit that one, but what we are gonna do is once all the locking tools are out, I'm gonna rotate the engine over twice. So we do one sort of full cycle and that brings Piston number one back to top dead center of the compression stroke, which is what it was set at for when we took this all apart. And it's been set in that position the whole time I've been doing the work on this engine. So we're gonna take all the locking tools off, rotate the engine over twice, get piston number one to TDC of the compression stroke. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna refit these camshaft locking tools and probably the VBT locking tools as well just to check that everything's still in time. So we'll get it to sort of nearly two full rotations, not quite, reinstall this setting pin, so that when we turn it, the crankshaft will contact this again to confirm we're at TDC of the compression stroke. Then we'll fit these locking tools and that's how we'll know whether or not this engine is still actually in time after I've done all the work. And providing it is, then we can carry on and rebuild the rest of it and get it fitted back in the car. So I'm removing the camshaft locking tools from the top of the cylinder head. And you'll remember from the last video, when the codes on these locating points on the camshaft face upwards, it means they're in the correct position relative to the crankshaft when piston number one is at top dead center. Next, I'm removing the VBT locking tools and I'm also removing the crankshaft setting pin. Then I can rotate the engine over two full turns, but just before it completes the second turn, I'm reinstalling that crankshaft setting pin, then turn it the rest of the way till the crankshaft contacts that pin and then I know we're back at TDC for cylinder number one. At first glance it looks like those locating points on the camshaft are pointing directly upwards and they're in the right place but I'm going to reinstall the camshaft locking tools and also the VBT locking tools while I'm at it and it all lines up so that is great news. So there we go I've turned the engine over and everything is in time so that is awesome. So now all that's really left to do is the reassembly of everything and then it can go back in the car. So I'm gonna crack on and put on all the brackets, hoses, uh, all the accessory stuff. So the aircon compressor, the alternator, the water pump, like piping and all that good stuff. All needs to go back on. Um, there's, you know, all sorts of pipe around here. Uh, inlet manifold's gotta go on. The rocker cover needs to go on. I am just gonna rest this on here. I'm not gonna fully bolt it down yet because although I've got a new gasket, again, you need some stupid type of sealant, special stuff from Ford. They actually, in the Haynes manual, it says they use two different types of sealant for this. So one, a little blob just about here or here maybe, I think it is. So there and there, that you need one type of sealant and then you're supposed to have a different type of sealant for here, here, here and here that's not happening i'm just going to get some generic rtv we can easily pull this off again and redo it if it leaks but that hasn't arrived yet so like i said i'm just going to rest that on here bolt that on loosely for now and then do it up properly once the rtv arrives or the sealant whatever it is i've actually ordered it'll be fine but for now i'm going to crack on with the reassembly so it's on with the rocker cover loosely and then i'm reinstalling the vbt solenoid next i'm installing all the little sensors that bolt onto the side of the engine and removing the crankshaft setting pin and reinstalling the blanking plug next up is the dry shaft bracket followed by the inlet manifold and fitting new seals and then installing the manifold onto the cylinder head then finally for this side of the engine i'm installing the coolant lines that go to the oil cooler that's it for the back of the engine so time to move on to the front on the front of the engine i'm removing all the blanking plugs i used when i painted the engine block and then i'm reinstalling all the oil and coolant lines that fit the turbo then it's on with the water pump and thermostat assemblies and last but not least i'm reinstalling the vacuum pump
Right, okay, so we're making some really good progress, but I've run into a little bit of a problem. So the next thing is we're gonna reinstall the AC compressor and the alternator, but unfortunately we snapped one of the bolts for the AC compressor when we removed it. So what I did is I took the sump into work and Tony very kindly got out the rest of the bolt that was stuck in there and put me in this nice little bit of threaded rod. But I'm sorry, Tone, your rod wasn't long enough, so I can't get the AC compressor over this and then get a nut on it. It's just not long enough, so I'm gonna have to work on getting that out. I think he bonded it in, so while I'm finding that out, I'm moving on and tackling the fuel injectors. So we're gonna get the rocket cover back off of here and then I'm going to turn my attention to the injectors so I've already gone ahead and done this one but I've got a new seal kit for all three of the injectors so this one's done so it's this little seal down here and then this kind of plastic clip and then the green seal at the top so I'm going to replace all of those and then we're going to get the injectors fitted and I've also got a brand new set of NGK spark plugs which we're going to fit in here as well and the sealant for the rocker covers also turned up so I can fit a brand new gasket which I got with part of the rebuild kit which you can just see on top of the toolbox there so I've got the new gasket and then I've got the sealant that you need to put in a couple of little places on top of here and then we can get this fitted for good. The green seal at the top along with the plastic clip are fairly easy to remove just with a flat blade screwdriver. The seal on the stem of the injector is a little more difficult. The manual actually suggests to cut this off with a knife. Reinstallation, again, the two top pieces, the seal and the clip, nice and easy to install by hand. The lower seal, again, is a nightmare because it's a really rigid material, so it's hard to stretch over the end. It is a special tool that Ford recommends that you're supposed to use to install these. I didn't have that, but I found with a lot of perseverance, I did eventually manage to stretch it over the end of the injector and get it on there. Once it was on, it did feel a little loose, but I think once it's seated down inside the cylinder head, it'll conform back to its original shape. At least I hope that's the case, and I will be keeping an eye on that once I reinstall to make sure there are no leaks. These are Ford OEM seals, like I got the proper parts from Ford, so I have no doubt that they are the correct ones for these injectors, but they just didn't seem to sit all that well. But another thing I noticed is the original seals that came off had a little ridge, which conforms to the shape of a little ridge on the injector. The new seals didn't have that, so I'm guessing, like I mentioned earlier, those seals kind of shrink down a bit once they're installed properly into the engine. At least I hope that's the case. If someone knows this for sure, maybe you work at Ford, then I'd love to know in the comments. But for now, let's get on and change the rest of these injector seals. With all the seals changed over, the last thing to do is just to install these little spring clips which hold the injectors down into the cylinder head once the fuel rail is bolted on. So I'm installing all three injectors followed by three brand new NGK spark plugs. Okay, so that's the injectors and the spark plugs in and I'm pretty much ready to put the rocker cover on now and the sealant for that has actually turned up. It's not the proper Ford stuff, but it doesn't matter. Like I'm, I'm just gonna roll with this and great. But um, yeah, so that's turned up now. But before I actually put the rocker cover on here, it's just sitting down there. I've cleaned it all up. It's ready to go. But before I put this on here, I've just asked on my Instagram if anyone's got any tips for how to like pre-lubricate this engine. Hopefully someone comes back with that and we'll get onto that. But for now, because I'm not quite ready to put the rocker cover on because I haven't had any responses yet, I'm going to switch gears again and we're going to move on back to the accessory stuff. So I did get that stud out. I didn't film it, but basically I just used the, I was going to say the tune-up method, but I actually used three. And then I used quite a lot of heat on it as well. This was just bonded in here with like some really strong kind of Loctite stuff, but that's come out and I've checked the bolt actually threads in there. So we're good to go with that. And I've got the new bolt that's arrived. So I'm going to crack on, get the AC compressor, get the alternator on, and then, then we can move on to the exhaust, turbo, and all that good stuff. So it's back on with the AC compressor, the alternator, the tensioner, and also the water pump pulley. I had to leave the AC compressor bolt slightly loose because there's a little electrical connector, which I believe is for the crankshaft position sensor, that you can't get into place. Once the AC compressor is fully bolted in, you have to leave a little gap, otherwise the plug doesn't quite fit through. Silly design, but... That's the way it goes. After I got these installed, it was time to move on to the turbo and exhaust. After drilling out one of the studs, which got stuck in one of the turbo flanges, but I got it out, retapped the hole, and was good to go. The turbo to exhaust port setup seems kind of strange. It goes exhaust port, gasket, heat shield, another gasket, and then the turbo bolts on. It seems a little strange to me, but I'll roll with it. Next, we're fitting the oil feed and return lines to the turbo. With these on, it's time to bolt the downpipe to the turbo, as well as the heat shield, which is attached to the back of the downpipe, which bolts onto the engine block in a few places, and there's also a bracket to hold the exhaust where it dips underneath the sump. With the downpipe on, there's one more section of heat shield, which bolts onto the front. I'm reinstalling this AC line, but I'm actually removing this coolant line because there's a broken piece of the auxiliary water pump, which calls the turbo that's stuck inside here from when the car was in an accident. And I actually think that that was the root cause of all the problems I've had with this engine and why I've had to rebuild it. But I've got the new part ready for when the engine goes back in the car. 
Speaking of which, that is the engine pretty much as back together as I want to get it before it goes back in the car. There is one more thing I want to do, and that is to fit the rocker cover. But before I do so, I'm just going to put a bit of engine oil on the camshafts just to lubricate them before everything goes in. I did use assembly lube to put this back together, but it's been a little while since I did that, so I thought it was just a good idea to put a bit of engine oil on here. I'll probably rotate the engine over a couple of times as well. I know it's not going to build any oil pressure, but I just thought that was probably a good idea before the rocker cover goes on. And I have got the right oil for this car as well before the wet belt please come after me and tell me that you need the right oil for the wet belt. Yeah, I know and I've got it so let's get the rocker cover on here I've got the sealant for that that's turned up as well and then it's time to fit the engine back in the car so I'm just pouring a couple of capfuls of oil down the full length of each camshaft making sure I've covered all the lobes and all the bearing caps next I'm cleaning up all the mating surfaces on the cylinder head as well as on the underside of the cam cover before fitting the new gasket then I'm applying the sealant to all the spots that it recommends in the Haynes manual before lifting the cam cover into place hand tightening all the bolts and then finally torquing them down and I also reinstalled the fuel rail. Right, there we go. The engine is now ready to go back in the car. Well, pretty much. I've got to get it down off the engine stand, get the gearbox on, which I've now painted as well. I did paint the gearbox in the end. The alternator and the AC compressor and stuff like that is kind of letting it down. So that's a bit of a shame, but nevertheless, We've made it this far. It's time for this to go in the car, but it has gone dark. So I'm going to catch up with you in the morning. The engine's going in. And then once it's in, it's basically just a case of sorting out all the wiring. I mean, it's three mounts. I won't put the front end on straight away, but obviously I'll have to put all that on to get the cooling system sorted. But I'm too tired. I'm too cold for now. So I'll catch up with you in the morning. Right, okay, so it's the following day, so it's time to get the engine back in the car. So I'm lifting the engine down off the engine stand so I can reinstall the flywheel, the clutch, and finally the gearbox. Now, I've never installed a clutch before, but I'm sure I'll get another go at it pretty soon because if I'm honest, it's touch and go what's going to last longer, this clutch or whatever fuel is left in the fuel tank. Now, I know a lot of you are going to tell me that I should have just thrown a new clutch at this, but I'm reluctant to do that because I still don't know if this engine actually runs. Besides, it's not you guys that are going to have to change the clutch, it's me, and I'm fine with that. So it's on on with the gearbox but before I lift everything into the car I'm reinstalling the starter motor I'm popping on a new exhaust gasket and I'm also fitting a new oil filter just because they're around the back and access is much easier with the engine out of the car Another thing I did before lifting the engine back in was just did a little bit of rust treatment on the subframe and any other little spots that I found and then gave them a coat of black paint. And with all that done, it was time to lift the engine back into the car for what I'm hoping is the final time. Now, it actually took me a lot longer this time. I think with everything else bolted onto the engine, it just made it a little bit more difficult. And also I noticed the sort of weight and the load spread on the crane was different to the first time I lifted it in. So definitely something I need to pick up next time I do something like this is a load leveler for my crane because it'll just make the whole job a lot easier. It was sitting too low on the gearbox side and too high on the engine side. So I really had to wrestle with it to get it to sit into place. But nevertheless, I managed to get it on and then got all the bolts tightened up. So that's the engine mount on the driver's side, the gearbox mount on the passenger side, and then the lower engine and gearbox or torque mount around the back. And then with everything sitting nicely, I could torque up all the bolts. Right, okay, so that's the engine mounted back in the car and it's taken me a little bit longer than I was hoping. It's actually gone dark already. Like, I feel like I've not really got anything done today. It took me forever to mount the gearbox onto the engine and then it took me quite a while to actually get everything back and mounted in the car. But it's all in now. All the engine mounts and gearbox mount and all that stuff, lower torque mount, all torqued up. My job for now is to get the wiring and some of the plumbing, especially around the back of the engine, all done because I just want to rinse out as much of that as I can while I've got the front end off. But that will obviously have to go on before we can start this thing. But that is the next job. So I'm going to crack on wiring and plumbing. If I can remember where any of it goes. Because it's been over a year since I took this engine out. So I don't know. <laughs> oh, let's get it. And so began the mammoth task of rerouting and reconnecting all of the wiring. Now, believe me when I say this, I can build a brand new wiring loom from scratch and I would much rather have done this than reroute all of this original loom. It took a long time and a lot of head scratching for me to figure out where any of this actually went because it's been such a long time since I took it apart. But eventually I managed to figure out the routing around the back of the engine, get into key components like the starter motor and that allowed me to bring the loom around and get everything connected on the top such as the injectors and the spark plugs. Once all those were connected I could start to work my way back down the driver's side and get all the wiring for the alternator and the AC compressor all connected and also that little plug for the crank position sensor which goes behind the AC compressor and then I could finally bolt the AC compressor on for good. The plumbing was fairly self-explanatory as well as the battery tray, the ECU support and all the other little brackets and bits like that needed to go on. Next, with the car jacked up, I reconnected the downpipe to the rest of the exhaust system and I also reinstalled the drive shafts. 
Then it was back on with the auxiliary belt. I attempted to bleed the clutch and failed miserably, and then refilled the gearbox with the correct oil that meets the Ford specification. It was far easier to do all that before the rad pack goes on, and that's what's going on next after I fit the new auxiliary coolant pump, which cools the turbo. Like I said earlier, this is the part that was damaged in the accident and is what I believe led to this engine overheating, which caused the head gasket to fail, the cylinder head to warp, and ultimately the car not to start due to having low compression. So really, all of this has just been for this tiny little pump. Well, those are my thoughts, and I'd love to hear what you think of my theory in the comments. But theories aren't going to get this engine started, so with the rad pack back on, I'm reconnecting the radiator and intercooler piping, I'm reinstalling the header tank, reconnecting the fuel rail to the high-pressure fuel pump, and then finally, it's on with all the intake piping and the air filter. Right, okay, so we are 90% done in terms of everything being back together enough so that we can start this car with just a couple of little bits of wiring that I need to do underneath for the fans and a few other bits like that. I need to fill up with coolant, I need to fill up with engine oil, I need to fit the battery, and then we're ready for the first start. By the time you're watching this, I've probably already turned the key and I promise that the first start video will be out next week. So for those of you that are new here, that gives you time to go back and watch the previous videos on this rebuild and let me know whether based on my original diagnosis and the work I've done throughout this rebuild, whether or not you think this car is gonna start when I turn the key. And like I said, let me know down in the comments. And if you hit that subscribe button, you can join me next week to find out whether I had a very Merry Christmas or whether I spent my week off scratching my baubles trying to figure out why this engine still won't start. As always, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.